um, in a week, uh, in, in two weeks, actually on uh, October the 20th, I will be in my home country, in Cuba. And uh, it will be a youth service. So if you liked uh, the music with Isabel Willits this morning, the praise band, the youth praise band, will be leading worship on the 20th. So that is not this Sunday, but the next Sunday. And uh, uh, I, I, maybe I can have somebody video taking the service because I, I, don't, I, I will not be here. And I want to see it. I want to uh, enjoy it. Um, but we are, a, we are a global Christianity. And I want, I want you to show you, I want you to see how many Christians in the world, specifically I chose one country, uh, how they worship and how they live. Uh, so these are some, some pictures of uh, Cuba. And this, that's a local church with the personage. And uh, in the uh, remote east part of Cuba, um, and uh, if you can see, that's that will the, the power of the projector it might not have. Maybe can you turn off the lights uh, to your left? Yeah, those. Thank you, Riley. So uh, that is a church in uh, the eastern part of Cuba. And um, somehow I am proud to be indirectly um, related to the foundation of this church. Even rustic as it looks, um, I was driving my motorcycle um, in 1987. So you can imagine how many years that, that was. And I felt the roads there are awful. There, there is no paved roads. So I, I fell into a, a pub block. Uh, I mean, um, Pop hole. I knew I said something wrong. It actually looks more like a swimming pool. I fell into it and I, I, I hurt myself actually. And uh, from a house nearby, they run and they pick me up. Uh, now I, I learned a lesson that day um, that I knew, but I, I, in, I internalized it even more. These were people who were not Christians. And they ran to pick me up when I fell. They took me to their house. They, I took my coat out and they cured me. They tended to my wounds. And uh, we became friends. Uh, they accepted the gospel. And now the Cuban government doesn't allow many new churches to be built. But they went ahead and built something even if it was rustic. And there is that, that place. This is in Olguin, for those of you who know Cuba east part of Cuba. Uh, in the next slide, you see where this place is located. Uh, did it get stuck? The, the next, there you go. That is, that is La Silla de Ibarra, for those of you who know Cuba. It's a, it's a mountainous area on the east, and that's where I was a pastor for two, for two years, 1987 to 1989. Uh, around that mountain, there are four churches. Uh, the names are very funny in Spanish. I'm going to say the names because we have some Spanish-speaking people here. Potrerillo, <laughs> Palmarito, La Lima y La Selva. Uh, so, Potrerillo means, what do you call a place where you keep horses? Stable. Uh, stable. So, the name of one, one of these towns is Stableville. <laughs> Potrero, Potrerillo. And uh, uh, so it's very rural. There was rural. There was no electricity, no paved roads, no running water. This is the house on the next slide. That is the kitchen uh, on the next slide, where uh, where I ate my lunch, or where the lunch was cooked every Wednesday and every uh, Sunday when I was visiting this specific church. It was a circuit of four churches, and I would travel around them. Um, as you can tell, this is no sweet. <laughs> um, uh, I have never had better meals than these meals. And uh, I have never experienced greater love than the love they, they gave me. They are really poor, as you can see. 
I look back and I feel ashamed because I didn't pay for my meals. I, I was not expecting to. I would have, I would have offended. They would have offended. They would have been offended if I had paid. Um, it was expected that the pastor was a guest, and they prepared the meals because I was just traveling, and they would feed me and give me a bed to, to spend the night. Um, I don't remember sleeping as good as I did in those years. The, by the countryside, the, the sweet and, and calm uh, mood of, of the countryside in Cuba, it was, it was just awesome. My, that, that's Nelsa, and in the next slide you, you will see Tite uh, looking for wood to, to cook. That's, that's what they used to cook. Is that a familiar, uh, <coughs> familiar view to you? <laughs> Uh, and to you too, uh, in, in Jamaica, uh, Kevin. Um, now, God is good, and uh, they're building a house. In the next slide, you see uh, they're, they're building a house. Um, and the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> this, this might be finished uh, when I get there, I don't know. Um, but this is the place where I will be on October the 20th. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. When I was appointed pastor to these four churches, um, and you can turn back the lights on, uh, Riley, thank you very much. When I was appointed pastor of these churches in annual conference, Cuba has a different style. Here in the U.S., you get the appointments. Appointments, that means they tell you where you're going as a pastor, the bishop and the cabinet. They appoint you. They tell you where you are going. So here we know ahead of time, and we we can even discuss uh, the SDRC. They had a tough time, but they finally accepted me to come here. <laughs> uh, because here you have a choice. In Cuba, the bishop stands on the pulpit in annual conference and he announces where pastors are going, and there is no discussion. Uh, when I heard from the pulpit, Armando Rodriguez, Potrerillo, Palmarito, La Lima, y La Selva, there was a silence in the room. <laughs> because nobody wants to go here. <laughs> and uh, um, it is actually sometimes pastors kidding. When you get a tough appointment, they look at you and say, good luck. <laughs> so I had a few of those. Uh, uh, People just come to me and say, may God be with you. Uh, well, I will tell you what, God was with us. God was with us. I look, I look back to those two years in ministry, and I had so much joy. I had a blast every time I talked to Judy Dana here, because she's telling me how she grew up in, uh, in Alabama, and she shows me the pictures, again, no running water, no paved roads, no electricity. I, I love talking to her because she understands and I understand uh, all the stories and all the love she has. She has in her house um, uh, something that I hope one day becomes heirlooms in your family. Uh, objects from the house she grew up in. Those are the best ornaments that she has, that she and Terry have in, in, in her house. So, in those times of, of poverty and uh, and uh, uh, sometimes hunger and lack of food, lack, lack of clothing. We look back to those times and, and we say, God was with us. And it was a real privilege. It was a real honor to, uh, to live those, those years in the presence of God and to experience what it happens when you give yourself up to serve God and to serve the Lord. I cannot tell you the peace and the joy that, that we had those days, the same as we had in uh, Africa when my wife and I served there, the same that we had when we came here, the same spirit. So now I, I just wonder why, why are we self-focused, self-centered, always looking our own good instead of looking the good of everybody. I think that's what Paul had in mind when he wrote this letter to the Romans. And he is urging 
to the Christians. He says in the next slide, um, Paul says, I urge you. You, you can tell you, you can tell that Paul is being serious. He's talking about something important. After spending three chapters, uh, chapters 9 through 11 in Romans, uh, talking about the salvation that will come to the Jews. And he's telling that because he's writing to the Romans. And there were so many disputes between the people in the church, the Romans looking for their own place in the church and access to power, the Jews doing the same thing. And, and Paul writes and he tells them, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So you see, sometimes we discuss here what hymns should we sing? What parts do we do we include in the worship service? Apostles' Creed or the uh, Lord's Prayer or contemporary music? I read Paul here saying that what is really important is for you to offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. There is no need to kill ourselves. There is no need to, to offer ourselves as a sacrifice for anything and to, uh, to take our lives. It's probably more important and more difficult to live every day for God than to take your life one day. So Paul is saying here, every day you live your life thinking about how you can work for God. Offer yourself as a living sacrifice. Do not conform to the pattern of this world that is self-centered, self-focused. We criticize idolatria. Well, sometimes we have to criticize ego or ego, ego atria, uh, the self being self-focused on looking only for our own good. So Paul says, change your, the way you think. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, listen, by the renewing of your mind. There is a school of uh, psychology, the behavioral, that, that, that they, they say the way you think has a, a, a major impact on the way you act. So think about it. Renew your mind. Think in a different way. Go out into the world thinking not what you can get, what you can grab for you. But think about how you can give, how you can please others other than only pleasing yourself. You don't have to please others all of them you please yourself. Jesus said, love your neighbor how? More than yourself? As you love yourself. Thank you. So it's not that I have to now please everybody more than I please myself. But I have to love everybody as I love myself. When I am going, when I am doing, when I am going about my life, I have to ask the question that, that Jesus turned around. In antiquity, uh, the rabbis used to say, "Don't do to others what they, what you don't want to be done to you." And Jesus turned that around. And he, Jesus said, "Do unto others, treat others the way you would like to be treated." You see, that's that's a radical shift. That's changing our minds. Uh, so that so that we can worship God as we become part of uh, sisterhood and brotherhood of, of humanity. So, and something interesting uh, Paul says here: when you are transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is: is good, is pleasing. And this is perfect will. This is a tough one. And I am so glad about this promise because I'm not there yet. Are you there yet? How many times do we ask, why? Why? Why is this happening? Why is why are there so many 
Why, why is there hunger in the world? Why, why are people so self-centered, looking only their own interests? And, and sometimes, sometimes uh, there is a tougher question when you see the innocent suffering. Children who die uh, much before their age. Children that would be cured only if they had access to clean water. To a mosquito net. Children that if they had access to the, the most simple kinds of medication in this world, they wouldn't die of treatable uh, illnesses. And we sometimes ask, why, why is this going on in the world? I don't know the answer to this. And definitely there is not justification for that. For, for that. And we have the promise from God through Paul here and in so many other so many other texts in the Bible. This is one of them and I love it because it gives me hope, it gives me faith that one day I will understand. I will be able to test and I will be able to approve that God's will is good, is pleasing and is perfect. It doesn't justify suffering in the world. But it, it, it tells me that God is present there with those who are suffering. When we change our mindset, when we build a bridge, when we go and, be, and become present in our midst, wherever we are, not only physically present, but present with our mind, present, present with all intent. What can I do, not only for me, for my own good, but what can I do so that um, my community, my place is better? I'm so glad that we have uh, uh, visitors and guests today from uh, our neighborhood. Um, we're, we're trying to uh, connect with our neighborhood. Indian Head Acres used to be uh, uh, the place of this church, uh, where many of you raised your families around here. Uh, when the children grew up and they left uh, college, they got married and moved some, somewhere else, um, then said, many of you said, okay, uh, this is probably now I'm not raising a family, probably now I can go and retire and go to another neighborhood. And you are here because you still love the church. You keep coming here. And we do have a, we do have a, a, a challenge from God because there are so many people around us that need the church. That is not judgmental. That is embracing. That is welcoming. And we are that church. We are that church. Um, and I, I pray that, that God will help us not, not to focus on ourselves. Um, I wonder if Elise, is Elise praying here? Yes, I am. Oh, she's, Elise, can I have your hand to stay here in the spot? Can I have your permission to tell the story of our conversation in the Nordex the other day? Since I put her on the spot, I, 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 it would be hard to say no, right? <laughs> well, uh, uh, we had a contemporary service like three or four weeks ago, and after we finished, I was talking to Elise uh, in the Nordics, and, and I said, Elise, how do you like worship today? And she says, oh, uh, uh, I don't care very much for those songs. <laughs> But I understand, because the new generations that are coming to our church, they also like that music. So I understand, and I'm glad that, that you were doing, that, that we were singing those, those songs. Uh, well, I appreciate that, always. We also love the hymns. There is a, a depth in those hymns. There is a theological depth in those hymns that we don't find in the contemporary music. Um, now, the music of those old hymns sometimes a little bit antiquated. <laughs> so we can, we, we can put them together and we can, we can incorporate all the hymns. And I'm, I am so thankful, Bob, that Kapalupa is a gift to this church. Amen. Because every time I want, I am looking for a hymn and I cannot find one, I call her and she finds the right hymns. Thank you, Monica. I love it. Uh, 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, when we focus on our welfare, not on my own will, let's have it our way, not my way. And, and, and then we will test. We will see. We have a promise from God here through uh, Paul the Apostle. Offer your body as a living sacrifice. Live for God, not for yourself. Live for God. The proper and the true and the pleasing worship before God. And you will see, you will experience, you will get to test and you will get to approve how good and pleasing His perfect will is. Let's pray. Dear God, as we prepare for communion, we remember your calling, your mission to go and serve, to go to those around us, to serve, to be present, to say like the apostle, like the prophet Isaiah, here I am, Lord, send me. Help us, God, to not think as the world thinks, seeking their own good. Help us to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, as we remember the living sacrifice of Jesus. Allow us to experience Him in our lives today. Allow us, God, to have true communion with your Son, Jesus, our brother, our Savior, with those around this world that are suffering like he suffered unjustifiably on the cross. And help us God together to experience new life and resurrection. 